Hi, Robin. Welcome to the uh, podcast, and thanks for taking the time to come here. Oh, I'm thrilled, Wayne. I, I so enjoyed speaking with you the last time, and I'm very excited about speaking with you today. Thank you. Likewise and likewise. Uh, uh, you've got a new book out, or well, new, it's, it was out in November, I think, called The New Art of Ideas, Unlock Your Creative Potential. And it's a. I found it a real combination of uh, big, grand ideas, practical advice, but also, and also I was really intrigued by some of the interesting examples of implementations. And it has a lot more than that in it as well. But that those are the three of the things that I really noticed about it. And we'll we'll get to some of the content uh uh, uh later in the in the in our chat. But first I wanted to ask uh when you're in an elevator and a, and a colleague asks, Hey Robin, what's your new book about? What, what do you say to them be, by the time you get to the 12th floor? I say that it's about how to generate worthwhile ideas and that I have a brand new framework. There hasn't been a new framework for idea generation since the mid 20th century. So I'm very excited to share this with the world. Right, very good, very good. <laughs> uh, maybe we can start uh, with where ideas come from. Uh, just before we were chatting there, I was I liked this quote from your book. Uh, you You say, uh, that a lot of people, here's the quote, quote, tend to think an idea must be fully formed from our heads like Athena did from Zeus. And uh, obviously that's not the case. Uh, otherwise, maybe we would have a lot more ideas in the world, maybe. How does an idea come from if it doesn't leap out? And like, where does it come from? And how uh, is it process-wise kind of thing? I think it, it's a really, it's a fascinating question because I think it really depends on the profession and the discipline. Uh, I think that for some people, ideas do pop, but it's not because they are geniuses or gifted, but they've learned how to do it. They've learned how to generate ideas over the course of their lifetimes. And so for a lot of people, I think it has to do with having a framework whether it's a traditional one, a conventional one, the most popular one is brainstorming, which I don't like at all, but it's a very, very popular one. Or there are other ones. Um, one is a five-step process where you do your research, you allow the research to incubate, and then the in the third stage, the idea is supposed to pop. It's the illumination stage, and then you test out your, your thinking. And so I think a lot of people use those. Um, in advertising and branding, what we do is we look for uh, insights into people's behaviors, and that often leads to a really good idea. And it really depends, again, on the discipline. You know, when you um, scientists and doctors and uh, engineers all, I, I'm sure, use different processes, but there are there are conventional frameworks. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm I'm not an expert at all in this feel or in this uh, discipline but uh, you mentioned brainstorming and I agree with you about that I've always thought of brainstorming as being uh, well we can't plan systematically and we can't be comprehensive let's just a bunch of us get together and see what comes up and um, yeah you'll get more than what you would get if with just one person trying to generate but what you get from that is not I mean, you could, I guess, tweak it and punch it and whatever into something that's usable. But I've always thought of it as kind of a last case resort or last last resort sort of thing. Uh, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, as does that is that do you know is that still a common thing in business now or in academia? Oh yeah, brainstorming. I mean, everybody knows what it means, right? Let's all sit around and, as you said, let's toss out ideas. The problem is that it requires you to toss out either a partially formed idea or a fully fledged idea. But how did you get the idea? So you're yeah. really just tossing out uh, notions. I mean, it's not really about ideas. And the the other issue is that it often becomes the uh, it, it defaults to the strongest person in the room, or it defaults to the one everybody agrees on, which is usually a pedestrian one, because everybody gets it. 
So it, it's really, I mean, I, I find it not a good method for coming up with ideas. I think it, it could be used for things like figuring out your goals, right? Where it's not idea-based, but it's, it's a, a to-do list. Like you just keep brainstorming and writing down everything that might be part of your life goal or your macro goal or your micro goal. But for ideas, I think you really need to think more deeply and actually have a process if you're not familiar with it. Or you could be, I'm, I'm going back to your first question, and this is for your listeners, Neil Gaiman, well, everybody knows who Neil Gaiman is, right? The great uh, writer has a blog and on his blog, he, he writes about a time that he visited his child's class in grade school. And everybody said, where do you get your ideas? And he and his immediately his default response is, well, I, I can't say it just they happen. And then once he realized that he was talking to children, that he better come up with a better answer than that. He did say, and, and I agree with him, that for a lot of science fiction writers or writers thinking about scenarios that don't exist yet, he uses a what if question. What if we could fly? What if we could be invisible? What if we could uh, jump from here to there in twenty feet? You know, the, these possible scenarios that we don't that don't exist yet are a great way to think about possibilities. So he he believes in the what if. He says it's a magical question. What if? Yeah, it's on. And I want to talk about this a little bit later on, but. Um... Uh, I, I think of that, for example, when I think of uh, the global problems that we have, and you, you talk about, I want to talk about the UN development goals and everything. Uh, in my opinion, and I'll talk about this, there's not there's not enough what ifing going on. There's a, a lot of stasis, and there's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. chitter chatter, but there's a, not a lot of what ifing and then acting on what comes out of that. Uh, so anyway, I want to get to that first. Before I talk about that, I want to talk about pasta because <laughs> that was, I found that a really great example uh, and it's entertaining as well. And it, uh, I, again, I'm going to start with a quote. Uh, this is from you. When my daughter was a toddler, she preferred to eat penne penne pasta because it was the only one that would stay on her fork. <laughs> I can see that because it would go into the little, into the tines, I guess they're called. Keeping spaghetti on her fork, not to mention pronouncing it, was frustrating. By the way, the correct pronunciation is gaschetti. Uh, there must be a typo in your book. I'm not, I was very disappointed to see that. <laughs> uh, and then you go on to talk about Dan Pashman, who hosts uh, Sporkful, and how he solved the problem. And he came up with something called, it, first, I love the the names of the criteria, <laughs> It, it had to have forkability. <laughs> I'm glad this is on a family show. Sauceability. <laughs> and this is my favorite, tooth sinkability, <laughs> which I thought, you know, they're all funny, but it's all perfectly accurate. And I've always felt that about Italian food, pasta, frankly. Not only is it all just sort of the same shape, or the same thing in different shapes, but none of the shapes are really awesome. Uh, I, you know, frankly, I'm a I'm a rigatoni man because it's it's the it's the best one that gets sauce in there. And anyway, but he came up with something called cascatelli, and uh, can you? I've seen I've gone online and looked at what it looks like, and I can see that it would have those three criteria, and. Uh, do, do you know, can you talk a little bit, bit about what his method was? And was that idea of him coming up with those three criteria first, is that basically the main thing, the main practical thing that would lead someone to come up with a brilliant idea for a new pasta? Well, I think what he was doing was solving a problem, right? And I think, you know, a lot of ideas come from what is necessity is the mother of invention, right? So you have a problem, the pasta doesn't stay on your fork. What do we do about that? And so what he did was he he went about to solve this problem, but he gave himself criteria to make it the best possible scenario. And um, the reason I include that in the book is because he really worked on it for years. And I think a lot of people think that 
things should happen very, very quickly. Right. And he had he had to sink a lot of his own money into it and um, people passed on it. And finally, he found a, a small company, I think, in Brooklyn, New York, to to um, invest and, and produce it. And, 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 you know, it sells out very quickly. So he, he did have a really worthwhile, good idea. But he he really labored. I mean, he really, really worked on it for a long time. And, and he talked in his own, um, I forgot the name of his podcast, but he talks about the process and how he was going crazy. His family was going crazy, all the worrying, all the money investing. So I think people, the takeaway is to realize that it does take time and, and a lot of effort to get something commercialized. And maybe a, another lesson from that is that and that's just if you and I, I'm not denigrating how easy or hard it might be or valuable to make a, a good pasta, but that's just for making pasta. Imagine for the other bigger, bigger goals in life. Right. Uh, those those will take uh, a lot of time uh, to to develop. And that's what I wanted to talk about next. And you list these. There are uh, the UN has come up with 17 sustainable development goals. I won't list them all, but these are the big, big things that we need done on our planet and need minds working on, you know, like uh, things like sustainable cities and communities and other like the, the big things that you hear either at the municipal level or the global level or whatever. And uh, I, I just wanted to get your take on it because uh I'm an optimist by nature, uh, uh, but I I despair of these goals being solved or reached because for two reasons. One is that they're led by politicians uh, who are generally more concerned with the short term, and the short term generally is, will I be reelected? And also they're very influenced by people who have money. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about someone who just has uh, $20,000, but very rich people who might have a vested interest in uh, penne, so to speak, you know what I mean? Who has a vested interest in things staying just the way they are, thank you very much. And that's why I despair a bit, that it might be, these might be all achievable, but I worry that the planet will be destroyed before most of them get done. Do you have, are you more optimistic than that? Or am I just, well, I'll leave it there. Are you more optimistic than that? I, I am. And I think it's because I teach Gen Z and Gen Z is very committed to change. They, they hold people accountable. They, um, you know, if you look at some of the surveys, I mean, this is my own anecdotal information because of the people, the Gen Z I come in contact with. But if you look at a lot of surveys, they won't even uh, patronize brands who are not who are not authentic and not doing something other than selling them stuff. And so they're looking to see what companies are doing. They're looking to make sure that companies are not just in there for profit, but are thinking about the triple bottom line of, of the impact of pe on people on the planet and creatures. And so I am opt I am more optimistic, I think, because I work with these wonderful young people who really, really care. And I think their number one concern is climate change. When I when when we talk about these issues, we talk about the sustainable goals in the classroom. I mean, we fill the board with issues that they want to talk about. But of course, they are actually put th putting them in their own minds into a hierarchical order. And I think that they're forcing companies to move forward with purpose um, and, and companies will have to start funding. They'll have to be private money. I don't know if the government's throwing enough at these issues, um, whether it's just within our country or, or internationally. But the problem is the money is the research. It's very hard to get science grants. It, it, there's not as much money as there should be uh, in any kind of public funding and so that that's part of the problem and if i could let go of my pessimism on these issues for a minute you do hear the occasional um news story there i i was listening to a podcast uh, earlier this week or last week or something i think it was 
it was one of the Nordic countries. It always seems to be one of the Nordic countries. It might have been Norway, where apparently like uh, something like three quarters of all vehicles on the road are EV e vehicles. And they've got a plan in place, not by 2055, but by 2025, yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, whatever it's called, the, the eng uh, gas engines, gas engine cars will not be sold in the country. And that's, you know, I, I guess it's the kind of thing where is working in that country to ramp that up is, is the, is the, you know, is that how you solve the problem in totality, I suppose. Well, so. I think you put your finger on it before when you said that there are people who want to keep it as as panic, right? They're, they're, it, it's very hard to go against the people in, in control of the money and, and the, the production when A, they're only thinking about profit and their own profit, and B, it's hard to go against star chamber thinking sometimes. So if you think about even Dr. Carrico and Dr. Weissman who created messenger RNA uh, medicine, they were really going against star chamber thinking and, and got tons of resistance, but persevered. So you're up against so many different factors, but I really think you did put your finger on it. It's always, it's a common thing through history, isn't it? It just, when you said that, it reminded me of, uh, I was going to say one of my favorite stories, but one of, it reminded me of what I always think of about Galileo and the Catholic Church. And of course, he was right, and the yeah. Catholic Church was wrong. But at the time, uh, he, he, I'm not, I, I can't remember, but he was denigrated, if not imprisoned for right. believing that. And it turned out that he was right. Um, I think of it that way. So maybe in a way that's hopeful because now I don't believe, I'm not sure quite what the Catholic church believes about what rotates around what, but uh, certainly the rest of humanity, uh, you know, is in line with Galileo. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, Sometimes I think very progressive thinkers are, are misunderstood and they're ahead of their time. And um, it, it it's really, it's very sad uh, that, people really do like the status quo. They don't like anything and, and they have their own interests, right? They have their own vested interests for keeping the status quo. So sometimes it's very hard to convince people of what could be really great ideas, whether it's, it's science or architecture, it, it's people push back. And even at a local level too, I'm just remembering from, um... I'm now retired. I've been re retired from uh, as a university librarian for three years now and liking it, by the way. And uh, although I love my job as well. And uh, but as a rule, I would say uh, many most people are resistant to change. So people get I don't know if it's about comfort. I don't know. if Well, I know it's about comfort. I know it's about fear. I know it's about uh i don't know i i guess i like i find myself the kind of person that i i i get tired of things and i kind of like i do very much enjoy change um and so in, in a, I, I don't know i'm i'm babbling a bit here maybe no I'm, you're not you're not babbling you're not babbling you you actually again you put your finger on something Wayne, <laughs> because you're so smart and creative is that it's it's uncertainty people don't like uncertainty and, and that's what change brings about. You're not sure what's going to happen, but because you're a creative, right? You're a writer and, and you have this creative, wonderful podcast. Uncertainty is part of the process. You're comfortable with it. But I think uncertainty really, really bothers people. And the more you can become comfortable with uncertainty, the more you can unleash your creative thinking. That's a, that's a that's a very good point. I wanted to really switch now because we uh, I, I was we were talking just a few minutes ago anyway about the grand ideas you know the these goals from the UN. But as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of practical advice in the book too. And uh, again, I just wanted to take a quote and maybe we can talk a little bit about that. And it, this is this is really practical, and uh, it'll give it'll give listeners an idea of any like I found there were if I could put it in sort of geographical terms there were hills in the book there were really high mountains and there were mid mountains and it was 
and I'm not saying it was disorganized, it's extremely well written as well. Uh, but uh, here, here it is, quote, prioritize your projects. It doesn't matter how creative or daring you are right now. What matters is whether you're open to revising your thinking to seek goals, gaps, and gains, and generate great ideas. And uh, I know the 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 gaps and gains and the goals is that's kind of at the core of your your method. And maybe for listeners, uh, you could say a little bit about that if you don't mind. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for asking about that. Yeah, as I said earlier, there there are um, conventional idea generation methods, but there hasn't really been a new one since the mid 1950s, which is kind of crazy to think about. And so. After years of teaching and, and seeing the great success that my students have, and they go into professions like adver creative side of advertising, branding, design, where they have to generate ideas every day, not once in a while, but on a daily basis and a lot. You can't show a client one idea. You have to show a client many ideas. And so I codified it. And um, what I came out with was um, an easy to explain method called the three G's. And as you said, there's a goal, a gap, and a gain. And the goal is what you hope to achieve. So that seems pretty easy to understand. And I think a lot of people think a goal is, is the idea, but it's not. It, it's part of it. The gap is what's, to me, fascinating about thinking about generating ideas, because a gap is what's missing. And the missing part can be almost anything. And I came to this from two ends. One is, um, as a scholar, when we do what's called a literature review, when you're first writing about something, you're seeing the, the, not, not novels, meaning literature, but the, what's out there, what's been written about. Right. And you're, you're looking to see what's been written about so you can understand everything there is, but you're also looking to see what's not been written and what you can write. Right. So you're looking for that gap in 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 the discipline so that you can fill the void. In fact, that's how we even propose grants. We say we're going to fill a void in a discipline. Mm -hmm. So that's a gap. In advertising and branding, we're looking to differentiate. We're looking for a gap in the marketplace so that we can put our brand in there and position it in the consumer's mind. So the gap is really important. It could be anything. It can be, as you said, um, thinking about chronic issues such as lack of clean access to clean water, unsheltered people, um, urban housing, so many different things that, that are chronic and that the UN is trying to address. It can be a toxic free production method. It can be a, pla a plant or a process or some kind of sustainable method. It could be a new class of drugs or medicine. It can be an underserved population or a population that's completely ignored. I mean, it can be anything that's missing. So that's the gap. And then the gain is pretty easy to understand too. It's what's the benefit. If you come up with this idea, who will it serve? Will mm -hmm. it benefit people? Will it benefit individuals, society, the planet, creatures? And so I believe that a worthwhile idea benefits either individuals, society, or the planet. I know I keep saying this, but <laughs> I, I really think that, that there has to be a gain beyond profit. Yes, exactly. I was just reading something just before we started to talk. Uh, from a journalist named Chris Hedges about capitalism, which of course is all about profit and uh, often at its worst doesn't care about the planet or people or groups or whatever. It's money, right? So uh, yeah, no, I, that that's a really good point that uh, something apart from profit has to be the, the, the gain, right? Well, I mean, to me, it does. And and I think that you have to really, we're in an inflection point, as you said, you know, we have to really think about impact. How is what we're creating going to impact people or the planet or creatures? Yeah. Robin, this has been uh, excellent. I could go on for another uh, half hour. Uh, for listeners, please check the, the show notes and there's links there to Robin's general website, but also to her, her new book as well. 
And uh, again, thanks very much for, for coming on. It's just been uh, excellent. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you, Wayne. Thank you.